how do you grind properly? By throwing a TLC album. <laughs> is that what it was? Don't is that what it was? go chasing waterfalls. Is that what it was? Yeah, we grind. No, that's not it at all. <laughs> my chasing. mind's telling me no, but my body, my body's telling me yes. We just had a bunch of followers. So that's R. Kelly. That's R. Kelly, by the way. And so you, that's bump and grind. That's bump and grind. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Howdy, y'all. Welcome back to Barbell Logic. This is your producer, Trent, again, and welcome to the second episode in this month's rebroadcast series. Today we're going back to another oldie but goodie. This is an episode that originally ran at number 27, and it's called Embracing the Grind. So if you haven't noticed a theme yet, we are going back to the basics of training, which, as I said in last week's episode, sometimes we can all be guilty about overcomplicating this stuff, and from time to time, lose touch with some of the fundamentals of training. And one of those fundamentals is simply effort. You know, I caught myself at the gym the other day doing some heavy presses. I was doing heavy triples. And on the third set, I was really starting to feel the fatigue in my torso. Everything was feeling crazy heavy. And I missed the third rep. I gave it a good hard fight, or so I thought. And I let it back down and put it back in the rack. Well, I figured I'd at least try to grind on the thing for three or four seconds. Probably not a full five, but at least a good three or four seconds. I go back and check my training video. Nope. I tried to power through the thing for maybe like one second before I let it right back down and put it back in the rack. Now, I'm not going to argue, and I don't think anyone else would argue here, that every rep needs to be a total bone-on-bone grinder. But watching that video made me realize that, man, you know, my sense of what effort feels like subjectively during the set has gotten miscalibrated a little bit. I've been doing a lot of volume work lately, haven't been hitting some real heavy PRs, especially my upper body work in a while. And so now I know going forward into the next time I do a heavy set that I'm going to have to bear down and give those reps a little bit more effort and probably get somebody to yell at me in the process. That always seems to help. All right. Well, that's enough blathering from me. Let's get to the episode. This is episode number 27, Embracing the Grind. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick, and I got, of course, Matt Reynolds with us today. And we're going to talk about grinding here in a little bit. Yep. But first, man, we wanted to talk about some friends that have been helping us helping us out with our supply. You know, it's yeah, not easy give a finding out. all these whiskeys, you know. I want to give a shout out to my boy, Jason. He is the manager of the International Wine Center, Brown Derby International Wine Center, Springfield, Missouri. That is one of the better liquor stores I've ever been to in the country. Um, and I know they're like a top 10 wine liquor store, but they've got an incredible selection of whiskey. And I have got some, Jason has hooked me up with some great whiskey over the years. And uh, so I'm very thankful for what he's he's done for me. He knows, we've talked about this, that uh, I don't even think we've mentioned this on the podcast. I can't stand the secondary market in whiskey. Uh, mm-hmm. You can, you know, these bottles of whiskey that retail. It's not very free market of you. Yeah, I know. Uh, but the problem is that they, that the problem is, is well, free market would be they would sell for, for the, what the supply and demand would demand that they sell for right. on the shelf. But instead they retail for, you know, a hundred bucks, 105 bucks, 150 bucks, whatever. And then there are people paying a thousand bucks, 2000 bucks for these bottles of whiskey. So I can't stand it. So, um, what some people might not know is the second you crack open a bottle of whiskey, it's worth zero. Sure. Um, and so Jason at uh, International Wine Center, at Brown Derby International Wine Center, which, by the way, is where Bass Pro Shops started. Uh, the guy that owns Bass Pro. Bass Pro headquarters are here in Springfield, Missouri. Actually, our wives right now are taking our kids to the Wonders of Wildlife Museum. Uh, it got started in the back corner of a Brown Derby. Johnny Morris, the owner of Bass Pro, his dad owned the Brown Derby. Hmm. And now there are about... I don't know, 40 locations here in Springfield, Missouri, some of which are super, super nice. International Wine Center is the nicest one. There's some super sketchy ones that are, you know, the hobos for the uh, aristocrat, buying the aristocrat vodka. They need served too. Yeah, they've got to, yeah. So again, supply and demand. Uh, But Jason's done a really good job of of making sure he knows that any bottle that I buy, I drink. 
I'm never going to put a bottle in the secondary market. So he knows. And I told him, like, the rule is you sell me a bottle of something cool, I will open it up and we'll, we'll share a drink together here in the store. And so he's done awesome. He's been a great guy. And so I just want to give him a shout out. I'm not getting, I don't get anything from that. He didn't pay for that. International Wine Center. I just want to give a shout out. We do a lot of whiskey here. And uh, if you were in the Springfield, Missouri area, by the way, they, they do some online stuff. Uh, contact them and uh, ask for Jason. Tell them Matt Reynolds sent you. And uh, so thanks, Jason. Thanks. For, and you guys have been awesome for he's, me. He's got more bitters than I've ever seen. Oh my God. The bitters are awesome. And again, my favorite, I've talked about those a couple of times, the brown, Walnut or the Why? black walnut bitters, uh, in an old fashioned is just absolutely incredible. So, shout out to those guys. We're going to talk about grinding. Uh, in the past, we talked about yeah, you know, it's like college age. <laughs> no, not that kind of grinding, not that kind of grinding. Do you know that the uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I was gonna <laughs> go ahead. Well, no, it's fine. I'm not going to go there. So, I was going to tell a story of my wife and I, but I oh, I in our early years. The full, the fully clothed grind story, but I'm not. Gonna, oh, I'm not going to tell the story. Well, you're. Yeah, you know, I'll be you in trouble. Still do that and be a virgin. Yeah, we uh, were. The God, I'm, you just blew my mind. Sorry. So a couple so episodes good. ago, we talked about you know things that cause people to fall out of linear progression, you know pitfalls, right? And one of them is not knowing how to grind. And so we, we've got enough to say about this. We can make a whole episode yeah. about it. how do you grind properly. So take it. Well, I throw on a TLC album. <laughs> is that what it was? Don't is that what it was? go chasing waterfalls. Is that what it was? Yeah, we grind. No, that's not it at all. Uh, <laughs> so that was your go-to. My mind's song? telling me no, but my body, my body's telling me yes. We just had a bunch of followers. So that's R. Kelly. That's R. Kelly, by the way. So you, that's bumping. Honor. That's bumping grind. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, so grind for real. Uh, you need to be able. To move the bar so slow that you might actually shit your pants. Yeah, that you can't tell it's moving. Yeah, so um, let, let's let's start with what people think is going on. So before we like joke about it and talk about the real serious part of this, um, I taught my mom, who's sixty three, how to how to deadlift. She's not listening to this, so because I've already sang "Bump and Grind" by R. Kelly, uh, but I taught her how to deadlift, and she had great form. She, had, she actually was. I was really surprised how good her form was. And I got her up to her first 100-pound uh, deadlift. She deadlifted 100 pounds. And started to pull the bar, and the bar moved incredibly fast all the way to lockout. Right. And the whole time it was moving, she, was, she said, uh, oh, my God, oh, my God, it's so heavy, it's so heavy, it's so She's heavy. She's talking, right? She's talking during the thing. And, uh, and then she set it back down. And she said, oh, son, son, that's so heavy, right? She Key indicator this, number one, if you can talk, it's not heavy. Yeah, right. And I said, uh, so I, I stopped. And, I, of course, I've had lots of out-of-town clients and clients over the years, same sort of thing. And, and I think here's the thing that we have to understand. 100 pounds for my mom, who was 63, is the heaviest thing maybe that she's ever picked up. And definitely you know, is the heaviest thing she's picked up in four decades. Yeah, if you're not doing what you do, what we do, yeah. you go get a friend. With, you know? Yeah, of course, 100 pounds. Right. Um, the thing is, is the bar speed told me that it wasn't heavy. And when I say it's not heavy, I don't mean just not heavy to humanity in general. I mean, it wasn't heavy to her right. because it bar moved fast. That's not a grind. Right. So our brains are built with a, a governor, like an engine is, that says, if it starts to move slow, put it back down. Right. It's like an oh shit factor, right? But we have to learn how to overcome that. And when the bar moves insanely slow, we keep pulling or we keep pushing or we keep squatting or whatever it is. And so we have to learn how to grind because at the end of linear progression, everything is a grind. The first rep is usually a decent grind, and the second rep is a big grind, and the third and fourth and fifth oh. are insane right. grinds, right? And we can't continue to make progress, and we can't get that refinement that we talk about every episode without learning how to do this. So if you have been coached by me, this is most easily learned on the deadlift because the deadlift starts at the right. bottom. I tell my clients, I've told, I've told every person who's ever been coached by me, I want five full seconds of grind before you put the bar down. So they start to deadlift. Even, and I tell them, even if you're positive that you can't get the weight, I still have to have yep. five full seconds of grind because I need an appropriate stress to be able to recover from and then adapt to get stronger. And my body doesn't know. You have to benefit from that. You benefit from it. Of course you benefit from yep. it, right? Like it's a, it's a huge deal. My body doesn't know if I hit the weight or not. 
The only thing that knows that I hit the weight or not is my, is my brain, is my own psyche, is my own confidence factor. And so if I pull on 700 pounds, which is, which is near my max, 725 is my, my max, and I pull on 720, 700 pounds, and it stops at like mid shin, tibial yep. tuberosity, you know, two, three inches below the knee. And I grind and shake yep. and the bar just won't move. And I grind on it for two, three, four, five. Okay, it's not going to go. And I set it down six seconds, right? My body adapts to that. Yep. You'll get stronger for that. But if I pull in 700 pounds and it feels like it's not going to break out the floor, it feels like it's going to be too heavy and I put it back down, there was nothing to adapt to. That's the problem. Yep. See, That's why we have to learn how to grind. And so you tell these people, that, I mean, I've heard, you've told me, I've heard you tell 100 people, five full seconds, five seconds of full effort. Yep. And they'll start the deadlift and you count back five, five four, four, three. So, yep. so that's, a, that's a big deal. So yep. your training partner needs to count for you. Yep. Five, four, three. Another thing I tell people is like, you can't quit. I'll tell you when you can quit. Yep. And I'll tell it, you when to put it down. It tells you, you know, if somebody's been training and I've been coaching them for a little while, that'll work. Yep. The five, four, three, two, one thing helps better for people that are helps more for people that are uh, newer to training. If they trust me, I can tell them, you know, push, 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 <gasps> put it down, and they'll put it down, and, yep. and they get their good grind in. Uh, and so every lift has a spot that's tough, right? And it's typically when one extensor hands off to another. Yep. Like so, in your deadlift, there's a hard spot, like you know, a little over your mid shin, yep. where your quads are spot. Ca- quads are kind of done working, and it's handing it off to your hamstrings. Yep. And that's hard. It's no man's land. Yep. Those two muscle groups are not at their most efficient at that place. You know, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of funny. For all the years I've coached, I've never actually considered it the way you're you're saying it. But it, you're exactly right. It's when. When one muscle group, which is like kind of the major force in the lift, dissipates yep. and hands off to the next muscle group, and there's obviously overlap, yeah, that's where the sticking point is, yeah. right? So when, where's when the sticking point on the bench press? And the bench press is when your pecs are handing off your triceps. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly when it happens, right? So in the beginning, it's all like pecs and front delts. And then there's transitions away from the pecs and front delts into the triceps. And at that point where it transitions, that's where the sticking point is. Yeah, it's, and it's, there's normally two joints. Main The way I see it is there's two main joints in the lift. Like in the squat, it's a knee and the hip. Right. right. So you're you're almost out of your knee extension. Yep. And then you're in your hip extension. Yep. And that's the hard spot. So your, your, your hamstrings, oh, yeah, you're handing it off to your glutes. Your hamstrings are handing it off to your glutes, actually. Yep. And so there's a hard spot in all these lists. The press has one, you know, about your hairline, yep, maybe your hairline. a little, but maybe a little higher. Yep. Depends on what your how what your arm lengths are. Um, so all of these have got a hard spot, and that's okay. It's okay, and it's okay for the bar to move slow. What's where it should move slow? By the way, that's if it, 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 it does if you miss it at a other at another spot, it's a form issue. That's right, or you, or psychological. Yeah. So. I had I went through a spell on the squat where I would get about five inches off the bottom, which is that spot. Yep. Five, maybe eight. You know, I don't know, five to eight inches somewhere in there, and uh, and it literally felt like the floor disappeared. <laughs> like I, there was nothing to push against. Mm. It wasn't that I didn't grind; I couldn't. Yep. And I have a friend. His name is Dick Gordon Jr. He's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's a guitar teacher, and he's a savant, and he's a straight up full tilt boogie genius. Okay. He used to. He used to. He is, he's a. Uh, he's a psychologist. He used to see patients. They lay on the couch and do the whole damn thing. And he got tired of it because people were evasive. And he's also a fantastic guitarist. And he decided, well, I'm just going to teach guitar lessons. So when you go take guitar lessons from him, you're not getting guitar lessons. That guy's tearing your brain apart <laughs> <laughs> because you can't hide. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to tell my guitar. He exposes story. you. I'm going to tell my guitar story. This is my grinding story. So when I came to him, I was already an okay guitarist, okay, and um, he has a he has, he wrote all of his own materials, and so uh, I got to like chapter seven of these materials he wrote, and I'll never forget. I got to exercise seven C, and uh, I would play, and he would put on like a click track or like a drum track, and he just play mm-hmm. with the drum track, and I would stop. He said, look, Scott, uh, you know, when you play music, you can't stop. Like, you can make a mistake, but, this, but you know, people are dancing, people are listening. You got to go on, man. The drummer's still drumming, the bass player's still, you got to play. All right, from the top. Three, two, one. Play, 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 and I get to the spot and stop. He's like, look, man, you can't stop. 
you can't. We did it again. Stop. He said, go <laughs> home, go home, practice this. Don't stop. Don't fuck. Don't stop. So I went home, I came back next week, and he said, we're going to play this. And when you get to that spot, man, he's like, no, make a mistake. Drop the guitar, but you pick that mother... You don't stop. <laughs> and uh, he fired up the little drum track, you know, and I started playing this exercise, and I stopped. And he took his glasses off, and he rolled his, rolling, his office chair over, and he got like an inch from my nose, and he said, did your parents not give you much validation as a child? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what that means. Um, but the guy, the guy broke me like a glass rod, man. <laughs> I cried and cried and cried. And, and How old were you? 34. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, something like that. And so we talked about it, and, and, I, and I found, he, we finally spent enough time on it that I, we, I learned that I, when, it, when it got hard, I literally couldn't see anything. Right. The page went blank. I couldn't even see the music. And uh, it had some root in like some fear of failure or something like that, right? You know, so I just wouldn't even do it, right? And luckily, I'm I don't know, I'm sharp enough or whatever that you know, most of the time stuff's not hard enough and I can just skate by and do right. better than a lot of folks and never get up against that. So I was squatting and the floor would disappear, like I couldn't even push, yep. grind hell, like I couldn't do anything. And I called Dick, I said, Man, you know, this is what's happening, and described it to him. He says, The same thing, dude. Remember? Oh my God. I remember. He said, here's what I want you to do. He said, um, in that in that liminal time, like when you're getting ready to when you're when you're in bed and you're not asleep yet, but you're relaxed and you know you're in that kind of liminal space, you know, he said, I want you to visualize that place where it gets really hard as a membrane. It's like parallel to the ground. And he said, when 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 you're when you're relaxed, and he said, I want you to picture yourself pushing and pushing through that membrane. And he's like, I want you to do that every time that you're, you have nothing else to do. I want you to visualize that. And um, so when it gets hard, you push through that membrane. And it's just a membrane. Yep. That's all it is. And you just push through that. That's good. And I went back the week, next time, like, I don't know. It, I was on a four-day split at the time, I think. And so I didn't, it wasn't, you know, the next day or whatever. Sure. So I had a little bit of time. And I could push. Yeah. So anyway, I don't know if that's everybody's problem, but there's stuff going on. Sure. Like there's a lot of, you know, 90% of the time people um, just are quitting too early. You know? Sure. They're just quitting too early. Um, but sometimes we have to practice that mentally. We have to go through the yes. mental exercise of like, what am I going to think? What is my experience going to be when I'm squatting here? How am I going to do this? Because if, if you try to figure out how you're going to grind when you're when it's time to grind, it's too late. Yeah, right. It's too late. You have to You've got to yeah. visualize you it. Think through it now. The idea of the membrane, you know, like a drum head, right? Yep. And you're going to push up through that with that squat, or you're going to pull that bar up through it with the deadlift. It's so useful. And you have yep. to practice. You know, what am I going to do? You have to visualize it and think about what am I going to do when that happens? What is that going to feel like? And how will I deal with it at that time? You've got to practice that when the bar is on your back. So when it's on your back, it's too late. Yep, that's good. Yeah, it's, it's weird because there's this, if, if you practice the other thing, which is failing, then you set the motor pattern to fail, right? which is what happens to a lot of people, right? So how often do we fail squats? How would you fail a squat? Not supposed to. I probably fill a squat once every 18 months. Oh. <sighs> I, well, I do more than that. but Yeah, I mean, but that's okay. Like Once a year, once every six months, yeah, whatever. Like, like, months like, or something like that. I just like it's can't do it. It's pretty rare. Um, you know, like I probably fail a deadlift more often more. mentally, and it doesn't break the ground. If the deadlift comes off the ground... I usually finish it. I probably miss two deadlifts a year that come off the ground that I don't finish. Um, I missed one not that long ago. Uh, where was that? Was that the the strenuous life thing? Was yeah, I think so. Okay? Uh, no, I pulled that. Let's see, I pulled that. It was the, it was the time before that. I don't I don't remember. So I, I we were in Tulsa. I pulled six fifty five and got it to mid shin and felt like I strained for five seconds and put it down. And when I watched the video, I strained for one second and right. put it down. This is the problem. That's why you have to have somebody counting right. five, four, three, right? They've got to go through that because you're, you're, 
you have no concept of time when you start to strain. So uh, it's not okay to miss. You have to learn how to grind through the things, right? You got to learn right. how to grind through the stuff. Now, uh, I miss more presses. Everybody's going to miss more presses yeah, than anything definitely. else because press is so... It's so much harder to keep over the middle of your foot. What's, what's that one for you? Every so, three months? I mean, there three are four times. Months? Yeah, I mean, and pl- not only that, but I program, you know, that I program press starts a lot. Mm-hmm. And so a press start is essentially a program press miss. That's really what it is, right? So I program a press start, which is, say, uh, 5% to 7% over your actual max after you're done with your press main press work so you take it out of the rack it's really heavy and you try to press it and you and of course it grinds at your forehead level and you grind and grind and grind and grind and it comes back down you know fails and you rack it and what's weird is usually like the third week people actually press it and hit a pr they accidentally hit like a five percent pr yep um and so i'll, I'll miss that sometimes because it's easier to you know to kind of misgroove a press uh, a bench. I, now, misgrooving something different, right? Like if that squat gets ahead of you know gets out over your toes or something, you know there ain't no grinding. Yeah, there's no grinding. Although it's you, one of those deals where I rarely misgroove a squat to the point that I I fail one. I rarely groove one correctly, right? <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> misgroove all of them, right? Or a press, you know, you throw it out ahead of you, you know, yeah, that, you know, right. That comes different. back down and then you hit it again. Uh, but yeah, the the thing where you start to grind on it, you grind for one second, you decide you can't get it, let it come right. back down. You don't get to decide. Like you right. your brain doesn't get to decide right. when you miss. Your body has to decide when you miss. And what you what what is amazing, one of the things we've actually learned from CrossFit, from guys like Rich Froning, is they realize that their brain is actually a limiting factor with right. this stuff. That's right. It's not your body. Your body will go further. So make your body grind as long as it possibly can. Push through that membrane. Right. And push. If it misses it's because your body actually missed, not because your brain allowed it to miss, not because you gave up on it. So that five seconds of grind becomes an enormous, it is something that it actually, it's probably, if we can point to a singular thing that is is the thing that happens during this refining process that makes us better, like that's the thing, right? Right. When, pe- when you learn how to grind on a deadlift for five, six, seven seconds, something changes in you, right? When you blow your first blood vessel in your eye, right? Right. When you shit, literally shit your pants for the first time. And look, like I understand those of you guys are listening to this thing and you're like, I've never blown a blood vessel in my eye. I've never shit my pants. I don't want to shit my pants. I don't want to blow. Yeah, blood. Me like, yeah, me neither. And I totally get it. Right. And it still happens insanely rare. It's not like this happens like every week. This is not mm. like a standard thing that happens. But like, if you've been training for two or three years and you've never accidentally shit your pants a little bit, you've never sharted. You haven't strained. Right. Everybody sharts a little bit. Right. If you're a female and you haven't pissed yourself. It's like an REM song, right? Yeah, right. Everybody sharts. Yeah. If you haven't, if you haven't had some incontinence from straining uh, on a heavy deadlift or a heavy squat, sure. you probably haven't actually strained enough. Right. Right. Especially if you've had kids. Especially right. if you've given birth vaginally to kids. Like you're, you're going to. I know l- when I had kids, that's when it really started. For right. Me. Of course. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there's. You, even if you don't blow blood vessels in your eyes, anytime I do a powerlifting meet, I blow little blood vessels in my eyelids. Right, I have little right. dots of red, little red dots in my in my eyelids because of the strain. And so, uh, when I get really heavy weight on my back and squat, like a five hundred pounds doesn't do it for me. It takes like five fifty or over. Um, I've I've described this a, a couple times before. I take the weight uh, out of the rack and I walk back. And the second I start my descent, usually there's music playing. It's at a meet, you know, so it's like I've got loud metal music. Uh, as I start to descend, the music drops an octave, right? Like it's you can hear the you know the beat, and it's da 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 da. It does that. Yeah. Um, and then my eyesight, the interest. So the first thing that goes as I start to descend in a squat is my hearing. And the next thing that goes is my eyesight. So my, I can see fine at the top. As I start to descend, it all turns red. And in the bottom, it goes black, and I can see nothing. So in the bottom, it's almost like you're at the bottom of the ocean, where there's like Whoa. insane pressure. The sound is really weird, you know. And, uh, and you can see nothing. And then as you come up out of the hole in the bottom of the squat, the octave starts to 
key starts to raise in the music and the sight starts to come back. And at the top, I can see again and I put it back in. And it's usually still, I can see red by the time I rack it back yeah, and get the red. Um, yeah, I get red. It's weird. And so I get tunnel vision. Like it closes in from the sides. Yeah. Which I mean, it and makes then, sense. Uh, you know, then sometimes it'll go completely black. Uh, I can't hear anything. Yeah. Like people are like, oh, what song do you want? I don't care. Yeah. It doesn't I don't matter. care. Yeah. Put on Barney. I don't care. Like <laughs> right. I can't hear anything. Yeah. That's why we yell all the time. You know, you're yelling at your client and everybody around is like, oh, God, this guy's terrible. Yeah. They right. can't hear you. They can't hear anything. I get in trouble more than anybody at the meets because I'm yelling at every client. Like I'm trying to talk to my lifter. And you can't and talk to him. You have to scream at him. No, you got to scream at him. They won't let me be on the it. platform. So I'm 20 feet away. So I'm screaming at him, trying to get it. And I understand. But like, I really don't care what everybody else thinks. I want a lifter to complete the lift. And so right. they, they, you know, they've got to be able to hear my voice. My voice has to be loud. So this five second grind thing is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, being able to learn how to grind is the most refining thing you can do in the process of the end of LP and uh, and going in your intermediate training. So, y'all, be, be be honest with yourselves. Be brutally honest. You know, did you give it everything? Think about what was your experience like as you failed. You know, you know, if you had a sharper shooting pain, okay, I'll give you that one maybe. Sure. But but if you're just like, gosh, you know, I don't think I can do any more. Well, yep. then you probably didn't grind, right? What was your experience? So when I sat, when I actually was able to sit down and get some distance from the lift and they say, what was my experience? I realized, like, psychologically, I felt like there was nothing to push against. Yep. Um, well, then that gave me some information. You know, I could yep. do something with that. And by the way, I'm like a middle intermediate by the time I start to have those experiences. I didn't have those in my 11th week of LP. Right. Right. It's like, you know, set five of whatever miserable shit Reynolds gave me, you know. Right. But, um, you know, yeah, be brutally be, honest with I was going to say, it's important to be brutally honest and vulnerable, right? So if it's okay, like, still, we all still sometimes give up early. We just have to recognize that it's not, not okay to give up early, right? So if you give up early, be honest with yourself and say, you know what? I, I watched the video. I felt like I strained for five seconds. I strained for a second and a half. That wasn't enough. And next time I have to know... If I don't have somebody counting down for me, yep. it might feel like you have to strain for 10 or 15 seconds to actually be five seconds. That's right. There's a time warp when it's heavy. That's right. You can't, you can't get it. So the key is everybody's going to make this mistake. Everybody's going to have times where they don't pull hard enough or long enough or whatever, give yep. up early on whatever rep. That, that, that in and of itself is not, is not a huge problem as long as you recognize it when you do it so that you know to work on the thing. Like, oh, you know what? I felt like I strained that long. I didn't. Brutal honesty. Brutal honesty. Well, there's another episode, guys. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram. We've gone through all these handles. You guys know what they are. But please, tell a friend. Share an episode. That's, that's the thing that we need the most. Thanks for listening. So we are drinking the finest whiskey we've had so far on this uh, podcast. We're drinking arguably 25-year-old Talisker. You haven't tried it yet. 25-year-old Talisker scotch. About a $800 bottle of scotch. Still smells like Band-Aids. <laughs> it's so good, though. God damn, it's so good. Uh, and the interesting thing about this scotch is that um, one of my clients, the only client I've ever had that was a a uh, personal training coaching client wow. that decided uh, at one point that he hated me. I've uh, hated you from time to time. Well, I mean, this guy actually wants me dead. He bought that bottle for me for Christmas a few years ago. And so I drink it all the time because, you know, I can't stand the dude that bought it for me. So um, that's happened very <laughs> It's much. like making out with his girlfriend or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, a, it's you know, it'll make my blood boil to tell the story. So I'm not going to tell the story. But, yeah, I trained a guy. The guy was, uh, you know, good buddy of mine and mm. decided one day that uh, he hated me. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I got a handful of people that hate me. And, I, you know, the interesting thing about the handful of people that hate me is that uh, I'm the common denominator. <laughs> right, that. right. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm polarizing and I'm good at making people hate me. But Talisker 25 year old Scotch, what do you think? Uh, mighty complex. Yeah, it's really good. It's just so, it's so good. You know, the sulfur in the peat really does smell, or not, I'm sorry, the iodine in the peat really does smell like band aids did when I was a kid. Yeah. So when I smell this stuff, it smells like, it smells like a band aid box from right. the 70s. 
And then, uh, and then you taste it, and it's got, of course, it's got the sugar in there. And then on the end of this thing, it's just like camphor. My tongue is like yeah. somebody just rubbed like, yeah, like Vicks on it or something. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's yeah. a very good, uh, a v- yeah, very good description. It comes in a beautiful box, and it's all you know, the the bottle is incredible. Wow. Did you see this bottle? Like it's just awesome. So beautiful bottle comes in this. Uh, get the wooden, get the wooden so stopper. It's padded, yeah, wooden stopper. Awesome. Mm. That's what happens when you've got a. You know, Thanks. This is a twenty-eight dollars, seven hundred dollar, twenty-eight dollars. <laughs> well, I don't know. What do you for think? a pour of that? Oh, yeah. Based on what was in the bottle, yeah. yeah but if you go to if you go to you know, that'd be that'd be a hundred and fifty bucks at a restaurant. That's good. Yeah, but I mean, you know, you know the rule. It's mm. all it's all open, man. I know you're more generous. I share than with me. share with everybody. Okay.